Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains! Only a suggestion, not a requirement. And today, we are going to discuss more train concepts. Weird ones, possibly insane ones. Ideas that were proposed for how to make rail travel better. They didn't come to fruition for one reason or another. Let's talk about that. Here's five more insane train concepts that were never built. Amtrak's high-speed train set. Now, I call it a high-speed train set, but I can't find that many sources confirming it. I'm only assuming that based on the fact that it is almost the spitting image of the original Shikenzen bullet train in Japan. So logically by the design, I'm thinking this was supposed to be Amtrak's attempt to also create a bullet train kind of setup. And a lot of proposals were done for that. When Japan revolutionized rail travel with the Shinkansen, plenty of other countries were trying to do the same thing, and some still are. France pulled it off, as did Germany later. British Rail tried, didn't go super well, but they did wind up with the HST, and that was pretty good. We in America never wound up with really anything like this. Such a thing probably would be beneficial for America, but as it stands, it still hasn't happened. Even back in the 70s, when this design was first proposed, they were still thinking about it, but it never got off the ground for one reason or another. And I can only assume that's because of the expense involved. Amtrak had a pretty big and kind of chaotic job. They had to manage passenger lines in America at a time when people just weren't riding trains that much. They inherited most of their early rolling stock from the companies whose lines they took over, and much of that was completely different from each other. They were non-standard by default. Would it have been nice to create a wholly revolutionary idea at that time? Sure, but that would have required a lot of money, and Amtrak just didn't have enough of it. They did have enough to standardize the rail network, though, with more conventional diesel locomotives and some electrics. And in the end, that turned out all right for the most part, but to date, we still haven't gotten anything like this. And it makes me wonder, why not? Can we just, for once, spend the enormous amount of money my country has on something that would benefit us? Can we do that? Is that okay? Did the Navy need 11 aircraft carriers? We just need to drop it by one, guys. That's all I'm saying. That's like a billion right there. The Radio Tube Train. Okay, this one is a little more of a... Uh, cartoonish idea, and it really is just an idea. It wasn't even really officially proposed, as it appeared on the cover of Modern Mechanics and Inventions, which was a magazine that was sold in the 1930s. It was 15 cents, or if you're Canadian, it was 20 cents, because your filthy Canadian cents are worthless around here. This is America. <clears throat> anyway, in this August issue, the major advertised article is about a radio tube train. Now, radios were pretty revolutionary back in the day, and at the time, for a lot of people, they might as well have been magic. There was a lot of stuff that people believed they could do, and the idea of not only making communication wireless, but making electricity wireless was something that was entertained. We're just recently figuring out how to do that properly, and in a way that at least kind of works. To do it on this scale would be a tall order even now, and looking at this particular artist rendition, I'm not even sure what they're going for. Okay, um, can we talk about the giant glass orbs of electricity? I assume that's what that is. Can we discuss that? Um, what is the exact, shall we say, mechanics behind these? How does that actually function? Also, uh, giant glass orbs on your locomotive, huh? I can't fathom a way that could possibly go wrong. Also, your horn is a saxophone. Interesting. 
And looking at this, um, there's one other thing that really bothered me, because everyone focuses on the entire thing, which is arguably impossible, but I'm more focused on the fact of, um, who's driving this? This is a serious question. As far as I can tell, there's no place for any kind of driver, engineer, fireman, anyone to sit and control this thing. So is this autonomous? Is it remote controlled? Like, how is this supposed to function in this setup? Even from an artist's rendition, it doesn't really seem to have a lot of thought put into it when it comes to practicality sick. And even to this day, we don't have anything like this running now. Certainly electric trains are a thing, but not to... Uh, Radio tube trains. That, that, that's not so. No, no, that's not something we've we we we've, we've done uh, as of yet. Anyway, M maybe someday. Probably, probably not. Westinghouse's 16 axle electric locomotive. What the heck is going on? Did I really just say that? Yes, I did. I did. I did say that. 16 axles on an electric locomotive. Why? What? What is the point of this? I mean, the centipede was one thing, but this... Well, it, uh... Gives it some competition in the unnecessary amount of wheels department. The proposal seemed to have targeted the Pennsylvania Railroad. And in the end, this thing was supposed to supply 7,500 horsepower. That is insanity. Especially for 1948. Modern diesels usually don't break 6,500. Maybe a little higher than that, but on the high end, it's usually between 5,000 and 6,000. This would have smashed that, and it was 1948. The big boy wasn't even that powerful. I mean, what the heck is happening here? Why would you need such unnecessary power? Well, that's a good question. And that's probably why it was never built. It's just not needed. Plus the amount of wheels, like you were overcompensating. Why, why, do you, why do you need all those? You, you don't need all those. There's no way you need all those. I don't believe that for a second. I don't care how big chungus this thing is. There are so many wheels in that thing. 32 to be precise. Why? 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 What for? No, no, we're not doing that. The British Rail Class 51 Super Deltic. Ugh, come in! I just need to learn to accept it, is what I have to do. Okay, so, yes, you heard that right. There was a time when British Rail was working on a Class 51, and they were gonna call it the Super Deltic. Naturally, it directly relates to, well, the famous Deltics, which are arguably the most popular diesels the UK ever produced. They're up there with the HST in terms of their likability factor. People genuinely love the Deltics, and part of that has to do with their revolutionary engines. The Napier Deltic engine is a British opposed piston, valveless, supercharged, uniflow, scavenged two-stroke diesel engine. The Deltic name comes from Delta. It's triangular shaped. Very interesting, but very capable. Its power output was actually pretty impressive, especially in those days. It was used in maritime service as well as locomotives, but in the latter, it really only got utilized effectively in the initial prototype and the Class 55. But British Rail did want to keep using it. It wasn't standard, but they kind of wanted it to be in a weird way because it was good, and they knew it. The Super Delta was meant to be an evolution of that, though, disappointingly, the end result was not supposed to look like the Deltics that you're probably familiar with. Based on sources, it seems the prototype for the Super Delta was going to use the chassis of the Class 50. Two supercharged Deltic 18-cylinder engines would be in the Class 50's body shell. The shell would have to be slightly modified by about 2 meters. The final product was supposed to produce at least 2,300 horsepower per engine, so the total output would be 4,600 horsepower, which would have been pretty impressive, and they thought it could go as fast as 125 miles per hour, 200 kilometers per hour. They did actually place an order for the initial prototypes, but they wound up halting that. The reason? 
Well, um, they wanted to be a bit more ambitious. They wanted to reinvent the railway, make people want to utilize it. And rather than producing just another diesel, no matter how good the Deltics may be, they wanted to invest the money they had into something a bit more futuristic. The APT. Now, I've talked about how the APT didn't go so well, but in British Rail's defense, that was more to political issues rather than the APT itself being bad. It was expensive, but it did kind of work in the end. It's just the public didn't trust it anymore. Class 43 HST, though, did wind up turning out well, so that's something at least. It does make me wonder how cool a Class 51 Super Deltic may have been, especially if they had got it working properly, but sadly, it was not to be. The Direct Air Capture Car. What in the... Okay, that's obviously a mock-up, which, yeah, this entire list is full of things that never came to fruition, but this is a very recent proposal that still hasn't quite got off the ground yet, and I'm going to be brutally honest with you here, I don't think it will. Now, I could be wrong, but looking at a lot of this based on what I've seen, and even going to the company's own website, they're called CO2 Rail, this looks a little sketchy to me. I don't want to go outright and say it's definitely a scam. Maybe their hearts really are in the right place and they're really trying to make something here. But I've seen no evidence they had the capabilities of producing what they're promising with this thing. And the whole thing seems to be funded with donations. Not even sure they've gotten any proper investors. So what is this? Well, CO2 Rail Company was founded in 2020. Like I said, this is very recent. And the whole idea is to develop rail-based, self-powered direct air capture, or DAC technology, which would remove excess carbon dioxide from the ambient air using the global rail network, purpose-built rail equipment, and sustainable, train-generated, regenerative braking energy with no external energy inputs required. Okay, um, there's a lot to unpack there. Now, obviously, based on the CO2 issue, you know we're talking about the problem of global warming. Now, I understand that's a very hot button issue on the internet, and anytime it's brought up, the comment section involved with whatever it is turns into a dumpster fire. So I fully expect that. But I'm really not going to get into whether or not you want to believe in global warming or not. It's not really relevant to my interests at this time. What I am going to say is that Let's be honest here, I think this is a fair statement. Do you want to breathe in the exhaust of your car? No. No you don't. It is toxic. We all know that. So I think it's fair to say that putting that stuff just into the air, willy-nilly as we are apt to do, creating actual visible smog problems in inner cities, yeah, that is probably a concern. Whether or not it's a global catastrophe waiting to happen, you can argue about that all you want. But I think the notion of having some kind of recovery system for those toxic fumes isn't necessarily a bad idea. I just don't see it working in this way. So looking at the mock-up, obviously this is somewhat solar power, but they have hybrid written on it. Hybrid of what, though? I, I, you, you lost me already. Usually when people talk about hybrid tech, they're talking about a car that runs on both gas as well as electric. It, it splits it up to increase mileage potential and reduce the car's carbon footprint since you're using less gas, so that makes sense. But this isn't using gas at all as I understand it. Their plan is to use these cars on trains all over the world in order to recover carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Carbon actually is used in a lot of aspects, such as making pharmaceutical ingredients, or it could simply be disposed of underneath the earth. Which, yeah, that won't take up space at all, but, you know, whatever. This train setup is meant to be better than the current way that people are proposing capturing carbon directly from the atmosphere, as that requires vast amounts of land and energy to get it done, which is kind of counterproductive when a lot of the carbon that's being released in the atmosphere is from the production of electricity. These cars will be equipped with large vents to take in air, since this is being done while the trains are moving, that will eliminate the need for fans, which will save them energy. The cars will be equipped with chambers to collect carbon dioxide, which will then be concentrated 
and stored in a liquid reservoir, the carbon dioxide free air will then be released back into the atmosphere from the back of the rail car. Every 12 hours, at a crew change or fueling stops, the onboard CO2 reservoir is emptied into a normal CO2 tank car located at the station, and then later shipped to wherever it needs to go. And in theory, even if the cars don't get unloaded in that time frame, they are being designed to operate for at least 24 hours before needing to be unloaded. I just think this is stupid. Also, I mentioned regenerative braking. The heck does that even mean? Well, in a conventional braking system, the friction due to the application of the brakes generates heat that is released into the atmosphere. But in a regenerative braking system, the train can actually convert that energy that the brakes create back into electrical energy. And they can, in theory, use that to power the direct carbon capture process. Researchers estimate that the average freight train could remove about 6,613 tons of carbon dioxide every year. Okay, I'm gonna stop there, because I have there's so many problems with this. First of all, in one of the images, it reveals an initial issue that I have with it. You realize the vast majority of trains use diesel locomotives. Even the comparatively more modern ones, like the Evolution series, still have some emissions. So is one of these cars gonna have to just take the carbon out of the emissions of the diesels themselves? Like, okay, you're stopping those emissions, but I thought the point was to remove emissions from the atmosphere, too. I mean, wasn't that the idea? I, I, I don't... What? Also, there's a lot of assumptions here with this braking power. Like, are you sure it'll actually create enough energy from just braking to actually fuel this process? Because I thought one of the issues with taking carbon out of the atmosphere manually was that in and of itself it takes a lot of energy. The brakes can't be producing that much, can they? I mean, I believe they produce some, but not enough to warrant this, which I suppose explains why there's supposed to be solar panels on top of it, too, so that might help offset that. But then I have the problem of, okay, so you need at least one already just to deal with the diesel itself, because the train itself has emissions. But then the ones on the ground are removing carbon from the atmosphere. Okay, great. Yeah, but a lot of the carbon is in the upper atmosphere, I thought. Like, way high in the air. Way above where trains typically operate. Um, so far, I have not discovered any trains that are in the middle of the stratosphere. I will let you know if I find one. Just catching air on the rails doesn't seem like it would really solve the issue overall. Would it help, maybe? I, I don't know. Uh, possibly? But there's a lot of problems that I feel like aren't being established here. Also, um, you would have to convince all the railways to pull these cars on their trains. And I assure you, I promise you, they are not going to do that for free. That is not going to happen. These cars would have to be heavy. And you'd need more than one of them per train. Probably a few dozen. I mean, if you expect this to work, I mean, consider how many carbon emissions come from just cars alone, let alone electricity production. That's a lot of exhaust. That's a lot of carbon. One of these cars per freight train isn't gonna offset that in any real way. You'd need a lot of these. You'd need a lot of financing to build these, and you need to pay the railroad to actually pull these. Because as it stands, there's certainly no legal obligation for them to do that. I'm sure they would pull it if you paid them, but you'd have to pay them. And where is the money coming from? Do you think that you can sell the carbon for that much? I mean, I feel like if this was an actual profitable venture, people would have done this already. If carbon was worth that much on the market, I assure you, someone would have done this a lot sooner. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe selling the carbon for those pharmaceutical ingredients will work itself out and it'll pay for itself. But given the fact you're already taking donations for this, this is why this thing comes across to me as just a little bit sketchy. Because, again, it's just a concept. It's not like they've actually produced anything. It's just an idea. A thought. But in the grand scheme of things, I think at the end of the day, whether or not carbon is worth enough to fund this, whether or not you convince the railway companies to pull these, whether or not you're even capable of constructing some kind of new tech like this, 
I really think it's going to be held back by the fact that it's a big atmosphere. Yeah, you could help with the carbon towards the ground. I mean, maybe that would be better for us to breathe. But it wouldn't really help with the whole uh, greenhouse effect we got going on, as I understand it. I'm just, I'm just saying. Also, I was leaving this out, but it's really important to me, and I want to stress this. You need to fire your 3D graphics guy, at least in terms of his color scheme, because this whole thing reeks of graphic design is my passion, and I hate it. I just want you to know that. And with that, a special thank you goes out to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Some Dude 267 Orange Glass, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoff 444, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsu 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, DM Tribal Typhoon, Tommy Rossini, Ohio Trucker 1, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, and Joshua Long. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.